Titus 1, 4. It says here, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay? Paul was the one had, that had led Titus to the Lord. That's why spiritually he was like a father to him. You say, well, then Paul should have taken the title of father, right? Wrong. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse twelve. Okay, twelve and thirteen here it says, For our rejoicing is this the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's chapter one. Sorry, looking at the wrong one. Um, chapter two, verse twelve. I'll get it right this time. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened un unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Wait a second. Back there in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, he says, You're my son. Here he says, You're my brother. How could you be son and brother at the same time? Well, spiritually, he's saying, I'm the one that led you to the Lord, so you're like a son to me, but your standing is, you're my brother. See? See how that thing works? And if you want to have somebody that tries to say, oh, you know, call me father, you know, whatever. Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 through 11 says, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are all, or sorry, ye, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. All right. There's really not any basis in Scripture for honorary titles among Christians. That includes pastor. Pastor is a description. It's not a title. And I don't believe you should be taking that. Doctor, reverend, give me a break, yeah. You know, no. And especially not father. Now that doesn't mean that you can't say to your, your the man that uh, is your parent there, you know, your father. doesn't mean that because the Bible says honor thy father and mother. All right, it's just talking about a spiritual title, a religious title. We should avoid that stuff. I'm your brother. All right. You don't have to call me Pastor Brian or anything like that. Just say, Brother Brian, I'm a brother. Okay. If you're a woman out there, you're my sister. We are all brethren. That's how the thing works. All right. Galatians chapter 2. I'll show you something else that's kind of interesting here about um, Titus. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says here, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run, or had run, in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Titus wasn't even of the same kindred. As Paul. So Paul called him, he said, Titus, my Gentile brother. No, he said, Titus, my brother. There's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? We are brethren. We're all part of his body, part of the church. That's what's going on there. Okay? So, you don't see anything, any, any support in Scripture for religious titles. I would avoid that. Back to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Titus 1, 5. It says here, For this cause left I thee in Crete. That's going to be important later. Crete, where he's at here. 
that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Um, this is very interesting too. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. Says thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Verse 5 there, uh, set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. You see what's going on there? Paul writing to Timothy, a young preacher, who is basically half Jewish, and then he has a Gentile, a Greek there, named Titus. And he's also telling him, I'm going to teach you the Bible, and then you go out and you look for faithful men who can teach others, and then you commit the same thing to them, and you turn them into elders. All right? The biblical model, and I was wrong about this for a long time, I was teaching the one-man pastor system, but the biblical model, the true biblical model is a multiplicity of elders. Why? Because then you can't get some guy on a power trip up there behind the pulpit running things and, and becoming a dictator, essentially. A man that cannot be questioned. A man that starts coming out and saying, hey, this is my church and this is my pulpit. And you're going to do what I tell you to do here. That's dangerous. What happens if you get a man, a single man pastor? What happens if he becomes in error? You say, well, the deacon board, and, and yeah, and I've seen a lot of those guys get run out because they have a power mad pastor. See? It's very important to have multiple elders in a city. All right? And what happens too, the other the reverse side of that is you can have a power hungry pastor, but that you, you can also have lazy church members. And you might get some guy that's there and he's been saved for years and years and years, knows the Bible very well, but he doesn't want any responsibilities or anything put on him and he just oh let the pastor answer, I'll do all my things for me. Shouldn't be that way. Should not be that way. Older men in the faith should be elders. Right? If they're faithful, right? understand that too. You don't just bring them in and say, oh, you're an older man, you know the Bible somewhat, so we'll make you an elder. No, you've got to watch out for that. But you see that thing there. Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Okay, it says here, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil." Now, I wanted to read this because we're going to go back to the book of Titus. And you can go back there, Titus <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And we're going to see these same qualifications. Paul telling Titus, these are the qualifications that you need to look for. But before we continue, I do need to correct myself. I was corrected by a brother in Christ, and he was absolutely right. And I need to admit an error in front of everybody, okay? He told me, he said that I should not be calling Stephen Anderson a novice. I call him a novice a lot. In some of my older videos, I've called Stephen Anderson a novice. And this brother said to me, Stephen Anderson's not a saved man. He, for a number of reasons, but mostly because of the fact that he does not preach repentance as having anything to do with salvation. Just believe and receive, you know, which is a false gospel. And of course, he hates the Jews. He's post-trib and, and he changes the King James Bible. I've seen him do it. So, Stephen Anderson, by biblical definition, cannot be a novice. He's lost. Okay, you have to be saved to be a novice. So, just wanted to correct that. I'll try not to say that he's a novice anymore. But going back to Titus, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I'll compare this in your mind to what we just read there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word, 
as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. All right? If a man doesn't know the book, he's not ready for ministry. And part of knowing the book is also knowing life application of the book. That's why you shouldn't be a novice, a extremely young man in his teens or something like this, like Bob Jones, the uh, senior, you know, supposedly started to preach when he was like 13 years old. You know, uh-huh, sure he did. Okay, you're a novice at that point. I don't care how many life experiences you've been through, you are a novice. Keep in mind that Jesus Christ didn't start his earthly ministry till he was 30. And if I can give some good advice to young men out there in their teens or even in their early 20s, learn how to do as much as you can with your hands. Work. All right? Learn as many skills as you can before you get into the ministry. God will show you tremendous things out there in the world. Work with the lost people. Get around them. Get out there in the world. Learn some skills. You know, I didn't get into ministry until I was after 30 years old. Now, I was studying for the ministry in, in my mid-20s, but it was a long time until I went into full-time ministry. A long time. What I do before that? I was working. I worked a lot of different jobs. Okay? I was a bus boy. I was a dishwasher. I was a cook. Um, I built in boats in a fabrication shop. Um, I logged. I was a wood turner. I worked at cabinet shops. I mean, I did a lot of different jobs, all right? The Lord taught me a lot of skills, gave me a lot of experience that came in handy later on. You got to do that. Verse uh, 10, let's continue on here. And we're going to talk, by the way, in a future sermon, I'm not sure when it's going to be done, but I want to talk about the subject of holding fast the, the uh, faithful word. The Bible talks about, you know, the form of sound words. We're going to talk about that in the future. The thing of, of writing by hand uh, versus typing and texting and things like that. Very interesting study coming out there. And also, of course, your vocabulary. Um, the more words you have in your vocabulary, it will actually take your IQ up. All right, there are studies on that. But we'll bring, bring that out at a future date. Still have a lot of research to do there. Okay, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. In other words, those that are Jews. All right, very interesting here. Mark chapter 7. Go to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 9. Okay, remember it talked about back there in Titus, it talked about vain talkers, deceivers, people that are unruly. It says here, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, ask him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things do ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Very interesting there. And it's interesting because whenever you see a preacher rejecting the ultimate authority of this King James Bible... What's he left with? His feelings. Traditions. Well, we always have done it this way. Well, this is just the way it is. I mean, you know, whatever. You reject ultimate authority, take it out of the picture, you know, see? Here it is. Here it is above me. I bring it down here below me and I eventually get rid of it. Take it out of the picture. Well, what are you left with? Me. Me. My opinions, my feelings, my preferences. See? Bring it back in. Now I can be judged. Yeah. Watch out for people that get you away from the book and start telling you that this book has errors in it and it's just a translation. Watch out for that. 
there were translations in the original autographs. Many translations, right? But uh, continuing, First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six, verses three through five. We're going to see this thing again about people that are vain talkers, deceitful, unruly. We're going to see about this. And see, these are the guys that you're going to need to study for that you can know how to answer them. I mean, the Bible version issue is a big, very, very big detailed issue. I mean, you got to know some manuscript evidence. You got to, You don't have to learn Greek and Hebrew, okay? You don't have to get into that, all right? I've never wasted much time on learning any of that stuff, whatever. But you have to know the history of the Bible. You have to know the history, where these manuscripts are coming from, uh, what Westcott and Hort's philosophies were, how this thing has moved up through the years, um, comparing Scripture with Scripture, compare the King James to the new versions. It's a detailed subject, okay? So it's going to take you a while to study this stuff. That's why you spend years working, and if the Lord eventually calls you into full-time ministry, so be it. All right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. That's why a lot of you right now are watching this sermon here. You're watching it Sunday morning. Why? You've withdrawn yourself from the Babel buildings out there. I withdrew myself. My wife and I left. Why? We could see what it was about. Right there, verses 3 through 5. Most Babel buildings, also known as churches, falsely known as churches, most of them are about money. Actually, they're all about money. Now, some of them might not be as greedy as others, but the fact of the matter is they are all extremely expensive to run. You got this building there. It's got to be heated. Most of them, it's a big, large, open room, so you don't have the benefit of smaller rooms and things that are heated easily. You have all these different things, zoning and all this other stuff that comes into play. They are expensive to run. So that pastor up there, the hireling, most of the time they're hirelings. Occasionally you get one that's just in there, he's ignorant and whatever else, but I believe God's eventually going to get him out. But the point is, these guys, they know there's a certain line I can't cross with my preaching because if I do, the congregation is going to shrink in size. We're not going to be able to pay the bills. They're going to shut the lights off. They're going to shut the heat off. We're done. Don't tell me about it. I've been to them. And if you're out there, you know you've been to them too. You've seen the politics that go on there. You've seen that. You know where that line is, where the hireling is not going to cross that line because he knows it's going to cost you money. Something to think about. Mark chapter 1, verse 22 says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. A scribe, a Bible corrector, has no authority on this earth. See, they remove the Bible. So you're left with them. They're the highest authority. That's the way it is. Go back to Titus chapter 1, verse 11. Titus 1, 11. It says here, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. How do these uh, unruly, vain talkers and deceivers, how do they uh, subvert whole houses? What do they just get a whole bunch of men and go rush the place kind of like a SWAT team and subvert the whole house? Is that how it works? No, the devil is much more clever than that. You say the devil will go after a certain individual in the house. If you know the Bible, you know where I'm going with this. Turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. You can read uh, 
verses 1 through 5, talking about the last days, and you'll see everything in that list is in abundance. It's manifest. You can see it. But look at uh, verse 6 and 7, talking about these false prophets. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are scores of hirelings out there who are described very well right there in verse 7. They are ever learning and never able, able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They are never able to accept a book on this earth as the final authority. You see? They are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you can gain great control over people because once you, once you take this away, just like Satan did back in the Garden of Eden, yea, hath God said, whoop, out of the picture, now anything goes. See? Now I can appeal to your emotions because you're no longer reasoning logically. I get to your emotions. See? I can lead you away with divers' lusts. I don't do that. You know, I get accused of that sometimes. You know, some of the people out there, you know, I don't even want to call them brethren, but they say I'm a deceiver and I'm lying to people and leading people away and everything. Uh, how could that be when I'm telling you to stay in the book and to check everything I say? How am I deceiving people when my, the authority is never me? It's the book. That's a rather stupid way to do things if you're trying to deceive people. I mean, if I was going to rob you, I'd try to disarm you first. Why would I come in to rob you and say, hey, guess what? Here's a sword. There you go. It's razor sharp. Just sharpened it. Okay, now give me your money. Well, that'd be dumb. Well, if I was going to deceive you, I wouldn't want you having a sword, a sharp two-edged sword. I'd try to disarm you first. That's the way false prophets will do it. And I get these false prophets all the time in the comments and all the time writing to me and stuff like this. And You're wicked. You're false. You're, uh, you're a deceiver. Blah, 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 blah. I say, okay, what was the scripture that you had to show me this? Well, I can make you look like a fool. You're this. You're that. You're, you're Scripture, please. Tell me where I'm wrong from scripture. See, the brother that wrote to me this past week and told me I shouldn't be calling Stephen Anderson a novice, he gave me scripture for it. I looked at it and I went, Ugh, I'm wrong. I better say something about that. That's why I did it. Why? Because we have a standard. Thy word is truth. That's what you're going to get at this ministry here. You always will. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 through 15. We'll read these verses. It says here, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Not talking about damnation eternally. It's not talking about losing salvation there in that passage. What it's talking about there is your life becomes like a living hell, for lack of a better term. You know, okay? It becomes very, very bad here on this earth. Verse 13. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering from about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Mm -hmm. See? So how do you subvert the whole house? You start with a wife. You see, women have a fault about them, and that is women are very sensitive. They're the ones that are there to guide the house to raise the children, you know. Now the father's there to correct the children and whatever else, but the women are sensitive. You know, they talk about a, a woman's intuition and a mother's intuition and things like this. Yeah. So you get a, a well-dressed preacher, and he comes to you and he says, Oh, dear friend, I would like to share for you some thoughts today based on the Word of God. And I, I, I do hope that I can be your friend through this. And, and they talk. If that guy is not quoting Scripture and telling you to turn in this book, and if he starts to question this book, he's a snake. He's a servant of Satan. And you better get away from him as quickly as you can. 
watch out. <laughs> Turn back to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Look at these two verses. Now remember where Titus is at? Verse 5, For this cause I left, left I thee in Crete. Look at verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans, you have Ephesus, you have Ephesians, Colossae, you have the Colossians. So here you have the Crete, people of Crete are Cretans. The Cretans are always are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. All right. What is going on there? Sometimes there are people that are so prideful that you the only thing left to do is rebuke them sharply. Because if it's all this, you know, I, I one of the most disgusting things to me is when you get like a, one of these debates. I've seen a lot of debates and things over the years, and it's like, oh, the the honorable so and so is here and to defend creation and science, and this man here is to defend the theory of evolution, or this man here is a King James only advocate. This man here believes in the new versions and. Let's all be gentlemen about this. Let's not use any kind of rude, harsh language. I could never do a thing like that. Because I understand what a man who defends the new versions is. The new versions come from the Vatican. He is an agent of Rome. Whether wittingly, you know, knowingly, or unknowingly, he is an agent of the Vatican. I think most of them know it. All right? I'm not going to have any respect for the man. I'm going to call them liars, deceivers. That's what you should do. The Bible version issue is a very, very serious thing. Extremely serious. That's why there are times when you have to rebuke sharply. Now, what is the best way to rebuke sharply? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What did Jesus Christ do when Satan was coming after him? It is written. It is written again. And I don't mean you go up to somebody that you're arguing with and, you know, contending with. You don't go up to them and smack them over the head with a Bible or something. Like that. No. What you do is you quote Scripture. It is written. Some guy comes along and they say, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in your ridiculous God. It is written. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Well, I'm a good person. They are corrupt. They are abominable. They have, have done, you know, wicked works. You know, if they, See? You get some guy, I'm a Catholic. I think I'm being saved. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Whap! Best way to rebuke somebody sharply is with the sword of the Spirit. Best thing to do. Titus 1.14 says here, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Very interesting. And if you want to read through the book of Galatians, if you want to see that thing there, the commandments of men and Jewish fables, where they're trying to get people to go back under the Ten Commandments and justified by the law, you're fallen from grace, all that. The whole book of, of Galatians can debunk this whole Hebrew roots movement. All these people that are going back and saying Yeshua and they're all this uh, Yahushua and all this stuff like this. What they're trying to do is they're trying, if you look at the end result of that, they're trying to get you back under the law. And they're denying the name of Jesus. They're saying that Jesus is a pagan deity and all this other stuff. They're, they're so satanic they don't know what, you know, is going, going on. Excuse me. Don't fall for that stuff, okay? Read the book of Galatians. You know, I'd like to eventually do a sermon debunking this whole Hebrew Roots movement because it's satanic. But really, honestly, all you need to do is just read through the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians debunks the whole thing. All right. Verse 15. 
Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Remember what it said there, under the pure, all things are pure. Verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ, there it is again, lowercase w, hmm, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word, word, you know, interesting, or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. There's a very, very easy little rule of thumb to remember to if you want to be a successful Christian in this life. And I don't mean success in mammon. I mean successful as in laying up treasures in heaven. You want to be a successful Christian? Okay. If you can thank God, and praise God for something, do it. If you don't feel comfortable, if you can't thank God or praise God for something, quit it. Simple. Very simple. Can you praise God for the food that you're about to eat? Well, if it's the right kind of food, yeah. Can you praise God for the thing that you're about to drink? Is it the right kind of drink? Or is it something that's going to make you lose control of yourself and maybe uh, become drunk? Can you thank God for, you know, thank, thank you, Lord, for this new keg of beer, or for, for this, you know, this case of vodka here. I'm going to get drunk tonight. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. We're getting drunk. Huh? I don't think so. Can't do that. Can you thank God for uh, looking at dirty pictures? No. You say, well, I'm doing it. Then you better quit. You better stop. Can you thank God for fornication? No. You better quit. See? If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, you're going to answer for it. And it's your problem, by the way. See, unto the pure, all things are pure. When you're right with the Lord and when you're sanctified and living right, then it's pure to you. Why? You get rid of the dirty, filthy, corrupt things in your life. Get rid of them. You're not going to sit down and say, Oh, Lord, I, I pray that you'd bless our time here watching TV tonight. We're going to watch a lot of uh, R-rated movies and things like that. You can't do that. See? You're going to watch pure things. And if you do see something that's horrible and wicked, you're going to ask for God's forgiveness. If you're right with the Lord, anyhow. But what about lost people? It says about those that are defiled, you know, in their mind. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Matthew 24, Jesus talked about as in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days of the coming, before the coming of the Son of Man. See? We're right back there again. See, how do you know? Every thoughts of the thoughts of excuse me, the uh, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, just like today. That's exactly what's going on. Psalm fourteen verse one says, "The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good." First Peter chapter four verses three and four says, "For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles." When we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Did you ever have that done? What do you mean you're not going to go out drinking with us anymore? <laughs> A little goody two shoes. Oh, come on. What are you, chicken? Oh, come on, what's going on here? A little, little good little Christian. Uh. 
I speak evil of you? Why? Uh, unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. It's dirty. It's filthy. That's why, dear Christian, you can't be around the lost world. All right? I didn't mean you can't work with them. You, you know, if you're a man, you got to have a job. I, I understand that. What I'm saying is you can't hang out with your old friends that you had before you got saved. Why? Their mind and conscience is defiled. Yours is pure. The old uh, get a nice pure basket of apples and put one rotted apple right in the center of it. Guess what happens? You come back in a week, that rotted apple is now pure. Right? Wrong. All the apples surrounding that one rotted apple, they're now rotted. You come back another week after that, the whole basket's gone. They're all rotted. Wormy, pussy, mildewy, disgusting apples. Why? Because you introduced something that was defiled. And as a Christian, if you introduce something that's defiled into your mind, if you don't get that thing taken care of, it's going to start to spread. It's going to become an addiction. That's why you're supposed to keep things pure. You're to purify yourself with the washing of water by the Word. That's what you're supposed to do. Titus 1, verse 16. It says here, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Do you ever have that? You get these people, you know, that uh, they're, you know, unbelieving. They're defiled and unbelieving. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. You know, and you talk to them about the Lord. Oh, I, I think I'm a Christian. I think I'm going to make it to heaven. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do some good things. I never killed anybody. You know, that's the famous one. I never killed anybody. You know, like that means anything. You know, what's going on? Well, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. You see, their actions in life don't match up with their confession, with their profession of saying, I'm a Christian. You see, when you're a Christian, you're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And notice that though it doesn't say unto every good work that they don't do them, it says that their good works are reprobate. How do you become reprobate? Romans chapter 1. This is where we'll finish here. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And you can read what those things are that are not convenient in the next couple verses there. You see. You see, the problem with lost people is they don't want to retain God in their, in their mind. You see, because if you retain God in your mind, you're going to purify your life. Things are going to be pure. Why? God's watching me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. See? But when you say, I don't want to think about what God wants. I don't want what God has for me in this life. When you start to do that, everything else goes to pieces. You should think of what God wants because it purifies your life. That's what's going on there. But when you see somebody who has a profession of faith and yet their mind and conscience is defiled and they're dirty and they make fun of you and things like that because of your standards, you're dealing with a false convert. And I know, I know some of the, you know, some people say, well, you know, it's really getting hard to tell who's saved and who's lost anymore because there are so many people that are compromising. There are so many people that are doing wickedness and sin and whatever else. I know that. I know it's very, very hard. And the Bible prophesies that there would come a falling away before this, you know, the rapture and then the time of Jacob's trouble. I understand that. I understand. Okay. But I always, you know, for me, I prefer to, to, if I'm going to be in error, I want to be on, in error on the side of caution. I don't want to go around telling people, oh, I think that they're saved, I think he's saved, when they might not be. And I can't judge what's a profession. And there, are, there are Hollywood actors that will act like Christians in a movie if they're called to act like a Christian. I heard that uh, there's some uh, Left Behind movie or something, one of the new ones coming out, and it's got Nicolas Cage in it. What's he doing? Well, he's acting like he's a Christian. Why? He 
He's paid to do it. You say, well, uh, maybe he's saved. Maybe he's a Christian after all. Okay, how can you tell if he's a, is truly saved or not? By his works. You see, simple profession of faith is not enough. And I'm not saying that you have to do good works to be saved. I'm saying you do works as, good works as a result of your salvation. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. See? And this stuff just makes sense. But you have people out there saying, oh, It's heresy. It's lordship salvation. Uh, you know. No, it's true biblical salvation. Something has to change. So that's going to be it for the... Uh, Titus chapter 1. Um, going to be doing the next two chapters here, chapters 2 and 3. Uh, do one a Sunday. And uh, there's going to be some new studies coming out here. Um, a lot of the uh, files and things that I had printed when I was down in Pennsylvania, I put them into boxes, stuck them in the U-boxes and shipped them. So I'm waiting for my studio lights. I'm waiting for a lot of the documentation to get here before I can do my other studies. Um, I do have some very interesting information on Elvis. Um, I know a lot of you have I made mention of that, and a lot of people said that they're really looking forward to that study. Uh, it's going to be interesting. found out some very interesting tie-ins to the whole CCM movement and Elvis and the Catholic Church. You say, you found proof? Oh, I found proof. You're not going to believe it. But um, interesting things coming out. But again, like I said, I have to wait for the documentation. I have to wait for my studio lights to get here. Uh, I, want to do, I want to start getting back into talking about Bible versions again, doing the uh, office-type studies. Uh, a lot of very exciting things coming up here. And of course, right now we're very, very busy trying to get this place fixed up. Um, Lord, you know, fortunately, we are coming out of the winter now. You know, It's late February now, and we only really have another month or two of of cold weather here so uh, the heat issue here is not going to be a big deal before real long praise the Lord for that but um, uh, just please keep us in your prayers because we're, we're definitely uh, have some very interesting studies coming out here in the future and uh, really looking forward to producing more videos um, I'm gonna try I'm definitely gonna have you know Lord willing as long as the computer holds out for me and, and it's been doing good by the way I uh, still want to do some tests on it and things I've gotten some really really good suggestions from some of you and I really appreciate that um, some of it's like you know <laughs> over my head but I'm, I'm trying to study and trying to learn some of this technical you know language and things and and uh, some of it really like I said great suggestions I'm going to be trying some things here um, but I want to have definitely a sermon a week and special studies coming out along with that and maybe some other little videos here and there so uh, we're going to be definitely increasing production as time goes by um, as things get sorted out here in the ministry headquarters and we get it toward, towards warmer weather and we get the stuff here uh, Lord willing by next week at this time we should be uh, have the uh, all of our belongings here finally Lord willing um, but please keep us in your prayers. And uh, we'll close here with a word of prayer. And then that'll be it for the video. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you, Lord, for the, the perfect guide that we have in your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have not been left here on this planet just wandering about aimlessly. And we really don't know what you want or what history was or what the future is. But we know, Lord. We can know through your perfect word, the King James Bible. And I thank you, Lord, for the saints that had to suffer so that we could have this blessed book in our hands. And I just pray, Lord, that, that nobody out there would give up their faith in the King James Bible, just as they shouldn't give up their faith in you either. Uh, there's a lot of attacks on you, Lord, right now. You know that better than we do. And there's also a lot of attacks on your holy word. And I just, I know sometimes, Lord, it seems so daunting. It, it can be very frustrating. People ask questions and you don't know the answers to it. And, and it's, it's scary. It's, it's, it's something that uh, I think most of the fear comes from not wanting to fail before you. But I just pray, Lord, that, that those saints out there that do stand for you, that do stand for your word, that they would 
hold fast the form of sound words, Lord, that they would not back down, even if they can't answer questions, Lord, that they would take some time to do some research and that they would uh, not get caught up with pride thinking that they have to answer everybody and everything right away, but just say, I don't know, I'll have to get the answer for that. And then, Lord, that you would show them the truth that they're seeking. And I just uh, thank you, Lord, again uh, for the ministry here, and I just pray that you would help us to be able to continue in it and uh, be a blessing to the people out there. And, and um, just pray, Lord, that each of us would be busy about your work with the time that we have left. And I pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be it for this study. I uh, hope that the Lord has shown you something through it. And uh, tune in next week. We will be on Titus chapter 2. And uh, Lord willing, some at some point in time, we're going to be coming out with some of these other studies interspersed with some of this expository study stuff. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.